welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. At least I'm in Dublin. It's virtually in Dublin. But today we have a speaker who is, would like to be, I'm sure, in Dublin. We welcome Stephen Mayor and have an interesting chat about Capital Markets Union, state of play and the way forward. Uh, you're all very welcome. We're going to talk for, you know, a while between ourselves, but uh, halfway through the hour, uh, I'd like to invite you to ask your questions. Use the Q&A button for that. Um, not the, I think it's the Q&A, but yeah, it's the Q&A function you're meant to use for that. And please identify yourself when you ask questions. It makes it more interesting when we, uh, who, who are you and, and, and what's your affiliation? You can tweet about the event. The handle is at IIEA. Stephen Mayor is with me, notionally or virtually. I've known Stephen for about 10 years since he actually, we, we both swam into uh, European financial affairs. He, uh, he had been in an official capacity before then. Stephen has been an academic uh, at the University of Maastricht, which of course is a, a, a great place to be a, an academic from the point of view of European financial integration. Uh, he then moved from that to the Financial Markets Authority of the Netherlands. But then when the European Securities Market uh, Authority was set up, ESMA, in 2011, he became the first chairperson. And uh, that has been his role for the past 10 years. It's coming a role that's coming to an end. He's not allowed to take more than two five-year terms. So at the end of this month, he will no longer be the chairperson of ESMA. So we are lucky to have him at this moment to um, speak to us about something which I think is uh, an essential. It is really a, a core activity of, of ESMA. It, ESMA is an, an institutional anchor, maybe the institutional anchor, maybe it should become more of an institutional anchor of the Capital Markets Union. Anyway, I can't think of anybody uh, more uh, equipped to talk to us about Capital Markets Union, where we are, where we're going, then Stephen Mayor. Stephen, do you want to start with a few opening remarks? Absolutely, and um, thank you very much, um, uh, Patrick, for, for that introduction. Uh, thank you very much uh, also to the um, uh, Institute uh, of European and International Affairs of Ireland for uh, inviting me to speak, as you just said. We, I would have preferred to be in Dublin. I always try to be in Dublin at least uh, once a year. Uh, we have, as an authority located in Paris, we have always had very good relationship with uh, the uh, relevant uh, interlocutors in, in Dublin. We have had, uh, obviously, the Central Bank of Ireland, which you've had it yourself, is a important member in the Board of, of Supervisors. Uh, of ESMA, we have had regular contacts with the Ministry of Finance and also obviously the industry, the financial industry in, in Dublin is very important, in Ireland is very important, uh, and especially the, the fund industry. So thank you very much for having this opportunity uh, to have a dialogue with, uh, with you. And let me also uh, congratulate the Institute with the 30 year anniversary. It is important that we have these type of uh, debates uh, and the Institute has been very important in um, uh, supporting the debates. So what I indeed would like to do is as a few um, opening remarks, uh, briefly uh, reflect uh, on CMU and I will try to limit to five to 10 minutes. And the three key elements that I would like to raise around uh, CMU are first of all, and it seems to be so logical and bread and butter, but you know, why, what is the rationale for having a bigger role for capital markets in the EU? Secondly, a few high level remarks uh, on the uh, plan as um, uh, published by the European Commission uh, in the autumn of last year, and then a, a few concrete action points, including also uh, in the area of, um, uh, of supervision. So let me first go to this first point on why is it important to have a uh, bigger role of capital markets in the uh, financial system? And I think the key argument is that, is that it would strengthen and improve the financial system and that the current dominant role 
uh, of the banking sector is making the financial system and ultimately uh, also the economy makes it, it makes it weaker. And it's a, it's a structural weakness that we should try to address. And interestingly, uh, also the banking community and, and the ECB, as you know, uh, Patrick, has been very supportive uh, of the capital markets union because indeed seeing uh, that there are some weaknesses with having a relatively large banking sector and a relatively small uh, capital market sector. What are these weaknesses? Well, first of all, I think you could make the argument is that a financial system in which uh, the uh, banking system plays a very extensive role is also one which is more risky and that if there is a downturn or a crisis has more um, problems to uh, recover uh, and, and I think the, the real life experience has been probably the, the financial crisis in which we were both involved uh, when we were sitting at the ESRB is that the financial crisis in Europe was especially deep and slow to recover. And I think the banking system, the very dominant role of the banking system played a role in that. The other element of course is, is that households uh, and other problem with the European system is that households tend to save through deposits rather than participation in the capital market. And we all know from our textbooks, from, uh, uh, from university, from, from finance, is that in the medium to long term, if you want to have better returns on your savings, you need to participate in the capital markets. And the fact that somehow European households are still over saving in deposits and relatively modest into uh, equity uh, and funds uh, or even bonds, is that that reduces the abilities of households to do on financial planning, is to save for the medium to long term for educational uh, expenses, for housing expenses, for uh, retirement. And finally, probably the, the, the remark that I would like to make is that in a system in which uh, banks play a dominant role is probably also a system where debt plays a more, more important role. Uh, and so if you want to have a financial system that encourages more innovative economic activities. Typically, innovative economic activities are better off uh, with having a more flexible financing system, like, for example, you have with equity. So that may, may be very briefly, but it will be good to, you know, happy to discuss that further. Secondly, on the, um, the CMU action plan, as it was um, uh, disclosed uh, and published by the Commission, uh, in September of 2020 of last year, I think a few high level remarks. I think the first thing what I th thought and think is really good about this is that we are moving away from not only focusing on, let's say, funding channels. So there's been a, there's been a big focus in, previous, in the previous capital markets plan on, let's say, let's try to standardize securitizations and let's try to get barriers away across the member states there, or let's try to get barriers away in the fund industry where there is a problem in europe is that irrespective of let's say the convergence issue we have anyhow low levels of capital markets activity across the member states so it is not only a convergence issue or a harmonization issue we also have economies where there is inherently low capital market activities and obviously with integration you get you know benefits of scale and that in itself can increase the scale of the market but we have also systems where um, the uh, initial levels of capital market activity is low. And I think that relates a lot also to this uh, low participation by households, uh, the, the low prevalence of uh, pension systems where you need to save. So there's typically pay-as-you-go systems, which also makes the need for capital markets less. And interestingly, if you go across the world, those countries, that have a thriving retail market, a thriving household market, are typically strongly connected also with generally strong capital markets. So if you go to the US, the UK, but even in the EU, uh, for example, in you know UK and US are known for capital market system where there's deep and liquid markets, but also the households, the end investors are participating in the capital market. An interesting example here is also in Europe is for example, Sweden a relatively small country, but with a relatively thriving capital market. Why? Because they have designed a pension system where there were strong incentives for households to participate in the capital market by giving tax benefits for when you participate uh, and, and buy certain funds. And I think 
if that is an issue that we need to work on also in the capital market union uh, a plan and therefore i'm very happy that the um, commission also has this perspective of the household or the end investor in their uh, cmu so and then finally just to go to a few concrete action points because i think ultimately it is also talking about uh, concrete actions related to my point around the importance of also having this household household perspective and their retail participation there are elements in the action plan and which are very close to the heart of esma related to for example financial education making sure that people understand that for financial planning in the medium term to long term it is important to participate in the capital market and not only save through deposits but also we have emphasized as an authority very much the costs of financial products because if you want retail investors to participate in the capital market, they need to have a relatively easy to understand, uh, uh, efficient financial products that they can buy. And one of the problems in the European fund industry, for example, is that we have relatively expensive uh, products uh, with high cost charges. And that is the reason that we have been focusing as an authority on how can we bring back those costs? How can we make it more efficient? And also how can we improve the quality of advice uh, that is delivered to uh, households. Second concrete action, a kind of a different one that I, I, um, that I would like to mention, but it, which is close to SMA's activities. One issue that is hampering, and this is more of an integration ar uh, argument uh, within the EU, is having cross-border information on issuers. So if you want to invest as a Irish investor in let's say a smaller uh, listed Dutch company, it is already more complicated to get information on that company. And so getting more information across the EU uh, on that would facilitate cross-border in investing would be very helpful. And therefore, I very much support this uh, proposal for the so-called European single access point where uh, you would bring that information together. So this is around information, which is already available uh, currently at a national level but you would make that available at the European level. And for those of you who are more into this, uh, to this area, you know that in the US you have the so-called Edgar system, which plays an important role for investors in getting information uh, on uh, companies to invest in uh, and um, uh, is, is a key element or, or a, a cornerstone for a well-functioning uh, capital market. Third, and finally, obviously, as you would expect from my side, is um is also talking about supervision um first i should say that i think that the uh, obviously consistent supervision integrated supervision of capital markets is an important condition uh, for capital markets in the sense that if a capital market becomes more important there's going to be more risks and they should be supervised uh, properly and for those of you who know esma well we typically look into supervision in two ways either you try to supervise it directly at a European level. And so in a number of areas, uh, including credit rating agencies, uh, ESMA is the direct supervisor. While in other areas, we're not the direct supervisors, but we have tools to make sure that national supervision is as consistent and as convergent as possible across the member states. And so as ESMA, we have worked very hard on either uh, executing new mandates regarding di direct supervision as we have regarding credit rating agencies or executing our powers to make sure that national supervision across the 27 member states is as consistent as possible. Uh, the powers in those areas have gradually improved over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, and I would hope that these powers would further increase in the years to come, especially as for example, uh, with Brexit, the number of key financial centers will also increase. So rather than having one local financial center that is dominating the landscape, which we had to some extent before Brexit, it will change where we will have multiple financial centers, including uh, Dublin being one of them. But then it's important that if we have different financial centers across Europe, is that the supervision uh, under which they are, is that that is uh, consistent. So I would hope also from that perspective that the convergence powers will further strengthen. And finally, on direct supervision and maybe also to stimulate a debate here, although I, I know that CCPs are not a key market infrastructure in, in, in Dublin, uh, I would hope that also there's gonna be more 
market uh, uh, direct entities under supervision of ESMA. And I would say that European CCPs would be uh, the first logical ones to move to uh, direct European supervision. We're already supervising third country CCPs. And I think it is a bit asymmetric that we're supervising third country CCPs, but not the European ones. So let me stop here, uh, Patrick, and uh, happy, of course, to discuss further during the, uh, the fireside chat and, and later on during the Q&A. Thanks very much. And you laid out some interesting topics which uh, dovetail nicely with the thoughts that I had, uh, issues I wanted to raise with you. And I'd like to start at the end where you're talking about a possible greater role for, for ESMA into the, into the future. Uh, I mean, as uh, I remember actually uh, here at the IIEA, uh, Lampalusi coming along to, to explain to us all, and I think I was the chair on that occasion, uh, to explain to us all the his idea of committees for, for banking supervisors, for security supervisors, and, and for um, insurance and pension fund supervisors. And that, that's a long time ago now, and uh, maybe 20 years, something like that uh, ago. And then the Lampalusi committees were strengthened in 2000, after 2009, the Rosier uh, said, no, they, 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 should be, they should have a, a more structural role and, and you know, um, uh, staffing and, and, and greater powers. And that happened to, uh, for all three, to the European Banking Authority and the AOPA and ESMA. Though in some ways, ESMA may not have been given as much autonomy or, or, or power as, uh, that, that's said by some people, I, I'm not close enough to it, but, but the role of ESMA, as you lay out in, in, your, in your, uh, you know, your annual reports and, and so forth, uh, there are four dimensions to it, and they're quite varied. You have assessing risks, and by the way, I notice from your latest dashboard, there are 10, uh, 10 sort of risk areas, and they're all flashing either uh, orange or red. In other words, high or very high, and five of them are very high. So, but let's put that aside for a moment. So that's the assessing risks thing, which, which you do. You have the, the formation of the rule book, or the, a common rule book across Europe. And you have a key role, I think, in, in influencing the commission, advising the commission on, on uh, what they should put into what is their uh, responsibility and what they should recommend to the parliament for, for, for primary, um, uh, pri primary legislation. And also you have your own authority to do. You have, there are 28 primary acts of, of the European Union which come under your, your remit. This is a monster uh, challenge to be in charge of so many uh, legislative areas with a comparatively small staff and this um, collaborative arrangement. Basically, your deciding body is a committee of all the member states. Um, and you chair that committee, a big committee now. Um, you don't have a vote, but you chair, you chair the committee. So it's, a, it's, it's not a, a structure which is designed for a rapid executive action. Then, but which would have to be the case if you were to be given, if your ESMA were to be given greater supervisory powers. You, you can nudge and push and encourage convergence and, and consistency, but you only have direct powers in very limited areas, as you mentioned. And you said, well, maybe they could, could add Euro CCPs. But, but if we're thinking along a horizon for the next 10 years, uh, probably it should go a lot further than that. And probably we should be thinking in terms of something like uh, ESMA becoming a European SEC. Um, and now, nobody can, can accuse you of, of empire building because you're, you're, you're departing the empire. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Is ESMA something that needs a leap forward in its powers, its funding, um, and its mandate? So I thank you very much uh, for that question, um, uh, Patrick. May, uh, so maybe first, I, I I do get a vote. I, I do get to vote now. So I that has okay. changed. That has changed in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that has changed in January 2020, and so uh, since on certain decisions, not all decisions, uh, but if it would be around supervision, for example, I can I can vote. Um, on maybe a, a quick reaction to 
Um, the, the, the key issue, in my view, in terms of taking decisions, is not so much the fact that we have 27, because we can we can gather quickly and we can and there's majority voting. And so the real issue is more indeed the lack of powers rather than the governance in decision making. I think some people think that if ESMA would become uh, a, a more direct supervisor, then there needs to be you know a smaller group taking the decisions. In reality, we are now we you know we have enforced we have we have, we uh, we are directly supervising credit rating agencies. The day to day supervision is done by a team within ESMA. Um, and the um, uh, and when we need to enforce, we do we take a decision in the board, and actually that has gone quite well. I think the real question is around um, uh, the powers and to what extent should we have further direct supervisory powers. Maybe a few comments on this one. But first of all, I agree with you is that the current structure, and it will not surprise you, is lagging the uh, is lagging the current integration of financial markets. So. I, you know, to some extent, markets are more integrated than supervision are, and I, I, I agree with that view. Um, and uh, and in that sense, I think it's important to realize that people sometimes think about European capital markets as national markets, and then suddenly decisions of ESMA to get involved in national issues. But the, real, the reality is, we have already very specialized markets across Europe, and to some extent. Amsterdam, Dublin, Paris, and, and Frankfurt are examples of this in the sense that uh, these are not all national, you know, to use this horribly popular term, ecosystems. This is already a European capital market where we know that Luxembourg together with Dublin plays a very important role and that in other parts of Europe, there is a very small industry and that there's already been uh, uh, benefits to skill economies. There's been the buildup of, of expertise. Uh, but the same you can say regarding trading venues um, and uh, and also to investment firms. And so, yes, I think you could make the argument is that markets are already more integrated than regulation is. And so in that sense, we should at least maintain the pace. And so to have the picture of the past 10 years, when we started, we were much smaller and our powers were much more limited 10 years ago. So we did only credit rating agencies. And our powers to assess national supervisory practices were much more limited. And so in the 10 years, there has been a gradual strengthening of our powers. There's been additional direct supervision, like there's now been added to the, the credit rating agencies, but also critical benchmarks will be added. Um, and there's been also an improvement of powers regarding uh, convergence. But still, if you would look for 10, 15 years ahead, I still would think that the model will not be a European SEC or a European SSM in the sense that this is around conduct supervision. And doing conduct supervision centrally at one place in Europe is going to be very difficult. And the reason being is that we're talking here around thousands of investment firms, thousands of asset managers, uh, and it is difficult, and some of them very local, very integrated into, let's say, working in their, their, their local language with their clients. And so a model where the whole of the financial sector, uh, sorry, all of the financial markets, all of the securities markets would be uh, centralized, I would see uh, that is difficult to see. And in that sense, I think it is important to, to realize that prudential supervision is different from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, conduct of business or investor protection type of supervision. If you want to look into, for example, retail investment uh, uh, protection issues, you actually need to go file by file and look at you know, what has been told to this client, which is written in the local language, did it meet the requirements, etc. While prudential supervision, to some extent, is more homo homogeneous uh, and in that sense also operationally uh, more easy to organize. So. Maybe, to, maybe a bit of a complex answer, but maybe to, to say it shortly, yes, we should progress. Yes, I think it is lagging. But I think even in the more end model, there will still be a relatively significant role for, let's say, local operations because of this issue around the fact that conduct supervision, uh, retail investments supervision also relates to thousands of interactions with individual investors. And that needs to be you know, supervised and addressed and for that, you also need to have an understanding, let's say, of the local situation. 
thank you. Yeah, I, I, I see. Um, I, I've already mentioned the complexity of the legislative structure, but there's also the complexity of the reform efforts over the last number of years. So the Capital Markets Union Initiative 2014, you have a number of, of uh, action, an action plan at that time, some action taken. And then, then we had the Thomas Fieser Committee uh, of a year or so ago to, to you know, re-energize the, the process, which some people characterize as having stalled to some extent. And following that Fieser Committee, they came up with 17 recommendations. And I see that the action plan of the, of the commission, which was approved by council, has 16 action points. And I'm wondering, it's, it's as if, it's as if the, something that is really big is being carved into small slices, and will they really add up to something big in the end? Is, is it, are we missing something that, that, that should be a big driver by, um, by, by just taking little actionable points? Is there a lack of appetite on the part of the Commission, the Council, to, to, to make a, a push that would be stronger and more comprehensive. Um, in other words, how do you assess the rate of progress and the design of the progress that is, is being made now in the second action plan? So maybe um, a few reactions to that point. Patrick. First of all, I think it's important. We, we're talking about capital markets as if it's a homogeneous activity or an, a homogeneous economic activity, which it's not. And so the um, capital markets plans will always be a little, you know, will always be a kind of a shopping list with multiple uh, elements uh, on it, because we're talking about trading venues, we're talking about uh, the, uh, the, the fund industry, it can be around securitization, it can be around derivatives markets. And so uh, it is, the capital markets are not as homogeneous, let's say, as, a, uh, as the banking sector. In terms of political will, where, and this, you know, linking to, to, to the points that I made earlier in, in my contribution, what I truly think is needed is having this increased retail participation. But that is an area where Europe has limited powers because it's around pension systems, it is around taxation, and you know, like the, 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 you can raise the question: while we can further harmonize and work on financial regulations and supervision, key elements in what drives how a financial system is shaped are shaped by things that are outside of financial regulation. It is around taxation issues. It is around what are the costs of of starting a new uh, 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 business. It is around pensions. And so, uh, and I think that makes it so difficult for the, the commission to act in this area is that I think the real game changers, like we have seen, you know, like if you go to a number of individual countries in Europe that have, that, that for example, have strong banking systems, but that were able to develop uh, a capital market that, that was not around financial legislation. It was around um, uh, issues related to taxation, it was around issues related to pensions, uh, how you tax pensions, how you tax uh, uh, the, the, the holding of stock. And obviously that is an area where formally the, the commission has no powers. And so we have progressed already a lot. And of course you can always do more in terms of harmonizing different rules. But the question is, isn't the real big big cha changes that are needed are probably in areas which would go, you know, where where the commission has limited powers. Yeah, that's um, it's a very interesting point because, I, from my perspective, I think there are uh, you you mentioned the, the role of of tax incentives and pension structures, uh, the, the the whole tax and regulatory structure around that. Uh, but I think also in addition, and, and I agree with that, and I think if you can look at not only um, <clears throat> your own country and the United Kingdom, in Ireland, uh, the growth of in insurance firms in the 1960s, 1970s, all was all driven by uh, tax incentivized. You, you, you pretended you were buying an insurance policy. Yeah, there was an insurance dimension, but it was like a small, small percentage of, of the uh, package. And, and the main part of the package was an, an investment, a savings product 
but it was all benefiting from the tax, tax advantage. And so, so we understood the growth of, of insurance like that. But I think there's also another dimension on, from the, from the um, industry side that the existence of large universal banks in, in Europe was the way small medium firms were financed. <clears throat> Whereas the, in Britain, right back into the 19th century and the United States, the United States had small banks and some money center banks, but basically they were left it to the small industry to, to finance themselves some other way. And that some other way turned out to be through equity markets and, and, um, and, and non-banks. Non um, so to some extent, the, to promote the securities markets is to try to, to, try to limit the activities of, of the, the, the big universal banks. Um, Though I suppose uh, it's not as if the un big universal banks are in the strongest position these years compared to what they were in the past. No, but I, I, you're right. I think that that element uh, certainly uh, plays a role. And uh, but we should realize that also banks will play an important role uh, in in capital market activity. Although it will be much more, let's say, fee based, and it will not be you know it will not be reflected in in the balance sheet, but it will be more reflected in in profit and loss. Uh, but obviously, capital market activity requires heavy involvement of investment firms, investment firms that are linked and have you know parts of of, of banks. Uh, but but I, I I think you're you're right is that there is also an element of ultimately it's also about market shares that are impacted by a, a bigger capital market. Mm -hmm.